Okay, so this next section is about 10 concepts that will help inform an asthma and anaphylaxis resuscitation algorithm. There's 10 concepts, but I'm going to spend one section on the first. What we're going to do is go through the first concept, and, but what it's going to lead to, these 10 concepts, is, uh, is an algorithm that supports you in time-critical situations. And uh, we've called it the AMAX4 algorithm. Now, it doesn't have to be uh, Max, it could be anyone's names. Um, uh, my, my Max's name's everywhere. Uh, you see maximum this or maximum that. Um, I don't really mind if you don't remember what the, the max stands for, but uh, what I do care about is you remembering the four. And really what the algorithm, wh what this mnemonic is saying is maximum four minutes, max four, four minutes. Um, if you remember what the other, the AMA uh, X is for, that's great. Uh, it, it'll be, it's a really uh, helpful algorithm, it, it like, uh, and I'll take you through why, um, but, but it's about the four minutes. Okay, let's get on to the first concept. Concept one. The time to a hypoxic brain injury is four minutes. Brain tissue has no oxygen or metabolic stores. Loss of consciousness happens um, in hypoxic arrest when the PO2 is less than 29, and that corresponds to roughly in the SATs of the 40s. So if your SATs are in the 40s, the brain's going to start to die within four minutes. Um, the areas of brain that die first are those with the highest metabolic rate. So that's universally first the hippocampus, followed by uh, well the cerebellum and basal ganglia, then the occipital lobes, then other parts of the brain. It is so predictable. So the time to hypoxic brain injury uh, is four minutes, but the, let's just talk about uh, primary and secondary brain injury. So primary brain injury is, is determined by the time to restoration of oxygen and blood flow. Um, and this is our specialty uh, as emergency specialists at the end of the ambulance ride to, to, to intervene at this point. Um, we have all the power to make the biggest difference to somebody's outcome in that first five minutes. We spend a lot of time talking about secondary brain injury in critical care. I do some retrieval. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, preventing secondary brain injury all the time. There's lots of research in intensive care and post-resuscitation care, millions of dollars. Um, but you know, the, the outcomes haven't really changed that much in the last 20 years. Um, it, and when I talk about preventing secondary brain injury, we're talking about targeted temperature management, glycemic control, etc., etc. But the biggest determinant, so yes, secondary brain injury happens, and when you have hypoxic brain injury, that injury continues, and so you get deterioration after the insult. So you sort of think you're going okay, but then the secondary brain injury, you realise that the, the prognosis is sometimes a little bit worse than it looked at the beginning. Um, but the, the primary brain injury is where all the money is. Yet, how, mu how many millions of dollars do we spend trying to get it right at the front door? How much time do we practice doing emergency tubes? Past four minutes, time is brain. Every second counts. Every second becomes tens of thousands of neurons. And um, that, that might, that's really important to the person uh, in front of you. And even if you, we're just talking about changes in personality. So if you get it right, they'll be back to normal. But if you don't get it right, well, then they've got this acquired brain injury. And if you re really get it wrong, then they're, they're in a nursing home. And worse that still, they become brain dead. So uh, it really is a super time critical condition. Um, and we should be very regimented. And we'll get to the regimented bit in a second. Everyone knows about the Elaine Bromley case. Um, this was a healthcare tragedy. Uh, there was 20 minutes of hypoxia during a routine elective operation. Um, the, the oxygen saturations were f uh, 40s uh, in most of that time. Her husband Martin pointed out that practice simulated competence at dealing with emergencies is, um, uh, he was a pilot, is, is what the medical industry also needs um, and should have as a benchmark. Yet the same thing is still happening 20, 20 years later. Um, this, is, uh, this is what happened to Elaine Bromley. I don't want you to read it, but all I want you to do is take away that um, four minutes, uh, well, uh, yeah, four, four minutes after the laryngeal mask goes in and she's in induced, her SATs are 40. So four minutes from there, her brain starts to die. And yet it goes on for another 20 minutes be before she, she gets uh, her, her oxygen back because they just stop the anaesthetic and let her wake up and they don't realise that she doesn't wake up in recovery. So 
Martin, Martin's been very kind. Uh, he, you know, we've had some correspondence. We've had uh, a really, I said, Martin, we, we need a, a hard stop because this stuff is still happening. And he said, well, sure. Then there, there's hard stops in aviation. For example, in, uh, if you're flying a plane and you get to a certain fuel threshold, it doesn't matter what other parameters are happening, you turn around when you get to that fuel threshold. It's a hard stop. And if you're flying a plane, you know, the ground's a pretty hard stop too. So there are some hard stops in aviation and we need some hard stops to help us in medicine. And we need to make sure that we have triggers for those hard stops. In resuscitation and critical care, we're, we're poor at articulating hard stops, like we say, early intubation or this because we have this sort of uh, cognitive, uh, you, you get to adapt things to different situations, but sometimes we just need to be regimented and have a hard stop because that's what our industry requires. Hard decks are important. Max loved Top Gun, so we're going to get to a Top Gun scene in a second. Um, but uh, this would be where the hard deck is uh, or the hard stop um, for a lane, which is there, and so that would have needed a surgical airway at that point. Um, now, Man's also very uh, good at pointing out the difference between uh, that you can't separate technical factors from human factors. And so what I mean by that is, if you're really good at intubation and you're comfortable with the surgical airway and you, you, you can draw up some adrenaline and push dose adrenaline and you know how to do NIV and you're comfortable with that stuff, then all of the things that conspire against you to, uh, all of the, that to, to stop you doing the right thing and confuse you, uh, all, all of those things become less influential because you're comfortable. You go, oh, oh, just, have, just intubate them. Oh, I'll intubate them. Oh, I'll do the surgical airway. So if you're comfortable with the so be good at technical things. It will help you. The human factors that we use are about equipment and identifying hard stops and maybe getting a stopwatch on the recess uh, wall that we don't use in Victoria, um, but some jurisdictions do. We rehearse mini sims, rehearse each, uh, and we practice things together. Uh, these are the ways we, we reduce human factor errors. Um, but you can't separate them. And, and Martin's keen to, uh, uh, is good at highlighting that. Um, I'm going to show you another video, all right? So if the sound doesn't work, you can always read the subtitles. So here we go. The hard deck for this hop was 10,000 feet. You knew it, you broke it. You followed Commander Heatherly below after he lost sight of you and called no joy. Why? Sir, I had Commander Heatherly in my sights. He saw me move in for the kill. He then proceeded below the hard deck. We weren't below 10,000 for more than a few seconds. I had the shot. There was no danger, so I took it. You took it and broke a major rule of engagement. <sighs> Lieutenant Mitchell, top gun rules of engagement exist for your safety and for that of your team. They are not flexible, nor am I. Either obey them or you are history. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Dismissed. So that's a little bit tongue and cheek, but also not tongue and cheek at all, because we need to be uh, good at what we do and set ourselves standards. And that's having some expectations is, is important.